Gather veterans, it's time to join the fight. The long war begins. This is The Long War. I'm Robbie B. And joining me once again are my partners in crime, Kenny Boucher, Mike Haswell, and Austin Wingfield. What's up, guys? Yo, dog, great to be here. I'm back. <laughs> Sweet Christmas. <laughs> New cage. So, Juice couldn't join us again tonight. He's got a lot going on, and a hurricane just rolled through town here. So, as you can imagine, he is uh, up to his eyeballs and busy, busy work. Or, as uh, Always Sony calls it, Charlie work. But... Uh, I'm sure he'll be, be back here soon, but we got Austin. What's up, dog? What's up? Hey, Haspel, where are you? Because your pictures on Facebook right now are like epic. Oh, I'm in Colorado. And the, all those pictures, they were up in uh, Rocky Mountain uh, National Park. Um, us, this park. That's where the uh, we were staying at the Stanley Hotel, which is doubled as the Overlook Hotel. The Shining Hotel. hotel. Yeah. That is the Shining Hotel, the well, actual funny. one. I got on my mm-hmm. computer and started working today, and I saw some of your photos I think you've been taking. And I had to go outside and, and stand in the cold weather and be like, this isn't the same. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you had to no, it was beautiful. It was really nice up there. Oh, yeah. He definitely had some, uh, some pretty fresh pictures. The Sexiest Man in Mountains, I believe, is what the introduction was for the webcast. <laughs> Obviously. I like to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rename him Skinny Haspel. Yep, I'm, I'm getting skinnier. So, no doubt. Ain't, ain't Soon there'll be nothing that. left of me. No, no danger of that happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, did, like, we, had, we had a podcast once where we were talking about, like, you know how they tell you I drink like eight glasses of water a day? It's impossible, but I can drink eight beers in a day. <laughs> like, no sweat, like in an hour. I can drink <laughs> like, like 45 that, minutes that is, to an hour. That is actually my speed limit of beer drinking 45 minutes an hour. hour. No. Eight, beers per eight, hour. eight beers per hour is uh is the speed I like to travel. <laughs> How fast are you going? I don't know. Uh, My speedometer stops at eight. <laughs> yeah. So mm. um break down this table of contents real quick. So yep. Because I have big news I want to drop here right, right after that. Okay, good deal. So of course we got uh, we got another fantastic tabletop market watch because lots of lots of spoilers and things on the horizon, but also things near and dear to us this week and next. Uh, we do have a webcast recap this week as well. Plus, Austin's going to break down some uh, dope battle for salvation coverage with the big winners and losers there, army wise, uh, from this weekend. And then of course we got the meat and potatoes of the show, which is will Eighth Edition fix 40k? Because more uh, rules. Uh, t- tidbits and uh, rumors out there going around as well this week too. Makes me super excited, but now I have to talk about something that makes me even more excited. And we're going to be talking about this. So get get used to it. We're going to be talking about this practically every podcast. Mike Caspel, the the world famous author of Graveyard Shifts, book is on <laughs> Amazon pre order right now. And now the synopsis is up there. The price has actually gone down. From what I hear, there's, there's, there, you don't have to worry about that, do you? No, no. It's like uh, if you pre-ordered the book already and you know the price has gone down, um, Amazon, like if you pre-order, you will get the, the, new, the lowest price between now and whenever the book actually launches. So you shouldn't have to worry about it. Mm-hmm. So, and, and they also updated the synopsis of the book. So that's on. Yes. There. Yes, they did. So that's up there. So you can actually figure out what it's about. <laughs> we did a dramatic reading of uh, the synopsis of the book by Kenny Boucher on the webcast. So yep, it was a webcast exclusive. You're going to have to go to the Hall of Veterans. <laughs> long <we're> <laughs> the there might be a dramatic pause in it and just spoiler alert. No, it was good. Yeah. I don't read so good. <laughs> uh, but I do other things well. No, nah, there's there's a, there's a lot of cool stuff out there. So, uh, man, I can't wait to see that book come out and get my hands on it and read it, read it up, or listen to it on Audible, whichever. Wow. Yeah, there will be an audio book version of it too. So, there you go. Uh, it will be coming out. So, for all us people that can't read well. <laughs> so, are you talking to me? Like, I don't appreciate that. <laughs> you take that back, right? I now. didn't say we didn't say read it all. We said read well, <laughs> read well, and other stuff. Not so well. Um, this week, what's this week? This week, we have new paints coming out. We got uh, creamy and chunky versions of all the uh, <laughs> the texture paints. 
Those uh, yeah. those look to be pretty cool. And some snow. Don't know how good it's going to be. Hopefully, it's that that sweet, sweet Colorado snow. That we um, all- I'm looking forward to those, man, because it's like, uh, especially when I'm doing like armies, like like Calth or something that I don't want to mm-hmm. put. You know, it's for the board game, so I don't want to put like some cool Elric's bases and stuff on there. I love using that texture paint stuff. It works beautifully. Yeah. And if they make, if they make snow, that's like, uh, you know, a combination, not just like, obviously it comes in a bottle. So it's some sort of, some sort of liquid, some sort of paste, um, pumice, some sort of thing that you brush on. They say, they say, do your all base, do everything. And then you brush this stuff on. That's the description of it. So, uh, if they simplify the snow tech, I'm okay with that. I mean, there's, there's other stuff out there. Like Kenny just dropped a video using the crushed glass that, um, I'm actually anxious to try some of that, to be quite honest. Oh my God, that secret weapon crushed glass is out of control. Yeah, it's. I, I watched your tutorial of it, um, and uh, I was like, man, I got to get some of that. And then I was it like, man, so, it looks so real. <laughs> it does. It really does. But I, I'm like, I already partially used snow, used a different kind of snow on my ogres. So like, now I have to finish it. I have to finish it all up together. So I'm like, kind of torn. Like, do I try to put some on top of it, like some new tech, or like just do not it? do that. Do not. Yeah, do that. I'm, I'm just like, I'm just gonna leave it. Leave it. There'll it's be another late. another another project for another day. I feel like so. Gone too far. Yep. Yep. Um, let's see what else comes out this week. Oh, uh, the Lehman Russ for Gene Steeler Colts, as well as is the Chimera. Is that just a new sprue? Yeah, they, they throw the upgrade sprue in there. So it's like, I think the normal Lehman Russ is 49.50. This one's 55. So well, this is, I'm very curious because the Gene Steeler Lehman Russ doesn't have access to all, all of the guns that nope. the normal Lehman Russ has. So they actually had to take a sprue out, I think. Um, I'm actually not sure. I've only put together a demolisher like five years ago, and I don't remember if it came with an extra sprue with like the, the plasma cannons and such, or if it didn't come with the Lehman Russ normal weapons. I actually don't remember because that's the one that comes with the Punisher cannon. There's no and, way I could possibly know that. Yeah, I'm actually. I mean, there's like there's a website we could go to to check it out right now, but uh, that's that's just too much clacking on the on the keyboard there. But gone anyways, too far, gone too far. <laughs> yeah, we can't go back now. So fifty five dollars, it's six fifty for the upgrades for the GCR Cult one, but the other box set, which is a Chimera and um, an Imperial Guard Cadian Shock Troop team, that is fifty five dollars, which is like kind of like a one dollar savings, give or take, if you don't count the Gene Sealer screw. So yeah, solid deals, solid deals. And then next week we saw something for Haspel's army. There's some new uh, uh, Stormcast going to come out in a couple of novels as they kind of uh, the lull before the storm, maybe running into who knows. Maybe we'll see some Kalth the week after for Halloween. Well, it could be cool. Or not Kalth, uh, Prospero. The, Prospero, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, Prospero. That's the one with the uh, custodes, right? Did that custodes? Yeah, yeah. Or maybe it's maybe it's Chaos Legions. Maybe it's maybe it's T Sons. Maybe it's that Sweet Magnus and uh, Haskell, Thousand am I, right? am I saying that right? For saying the custodes, yeah. yeah. Is, is that the, that's the correct right? Well, according to our professional writer on staff, custodes. <laughs> yeah. Custodes. So they say what Magnus became a demon prince after Prospero. Is that, is that yes? The fluff? That is yeah. true. Yeah. Oh, that model looks pretty sweet. I am 100% satisfied with it. I what, I, like it. what I like is the paint jobs that GW has been pushing out lately. The gallery, Cause I think they have a media team, a box art team and a, and a gallery team. And I mm. think that you can ma- mainly see the gallery team on like these, all these new um, board games and uh, these like independent releases, like these like super baller singles. They're pa- like their paint jobs are just ridiculous. Like I just love the color choices are so different than what we've seen in the past so exciting um i really i mean i was just blown away by that color, that paint job and it just got me like god damn it i need this goddamn stupid magnus the red in my army now <laughs> <laughs> yep don't even know what he does but don't even know what he does i just know he has like gigantic fucking water buffalo size horns coming out of where his nipples should be <laughs> i mean that's all you really need let's be honest now I, I would imagine he works something like uh what was his face can't not not uh Kairos, but the other guy's name, the the big gino- ginormous uh, Lord of Change for Apocalypse, where he could like use his staff to like summon squads of pink horrors and uh, super chicken, super chicken, yeah. So I imagine yeah. he summons in some sort of craziness. Hey, for for a mere you know nine hundred ninety nine points, mm, totally reasonably yeah. priced. That's I swear, most, the most random Lord of War of all time. <laughs> but I could also see him summoning 
or just doing be able to like steal psychic dice you know i would take i would take aramon's he should definitely he should definitely have this i mean he should definitely have an anti psyker like beyond all other anti psyker mm. like protection would you agree with that haspel because i know haspel is up on that yeah I mean, I, I think so. I think he, he would be... He would see that shit coming, and he's in tune with the warp, right? Yeah, exactly. So, sounds like he's kind of... Because he was like... This the, assassin demon prince. Yeah, well, he was like the psyker mm. of psychers before he became a demon prince. And now yeah. that he's a demon prince, he, he, he understands the warp doesn't affect him. Like, he is the warp. Like, and people are, people are playing with the warp to try to do silly shit, like mere mortals. It might, I mean... I, will, I just would love to see, like, yo, literally, dog, if I got Magnus, just pack your fucking paradise up. <laughs> yeah, your cabal doesn't exist. Mm, that'd, be, that'd be pretty that brutal. Would, that would hurt. <laughs> I'm not saying he's going to be at least a $100 model, though. It looks like he's on, like, a 100 mil round base. That's Do you know if it's a multi-kit? Like, will it let you make, like, a normal Lord of Change, uh, you know, using, like, an alternate kit? You know what I mean? It's hard to say because Scarbrand is a named character and you can only make Scarbrand and that's kind of on par with yeah. Archaon or even the Lord Celestin. Yeah, that, okay. I don't think they do that yeah. anymore. I think it's definitely about these models that are just so bodily, unquestionable, like one-offs that you, there's not even a lot of conversion opportunities anymore. True. 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 You know yeah. what I mean? that's, that's something that David always says he's sad about. He's like, these models are just so intense now I can't even like convert them anymore. But if you could have a different like, you know, options, like maybe not staff, maybe he's holding something else. Um, or something like that, something minor, not just like you make it this one way, you know, that right, would be right. crash. I doubt, building, it, I doubt it, but I would be happy to see that. I would build in the Star yeah. Drake right now, and it comes with like, you know, some minor changes to make like the different Star Drake. You know, Star Drake ain't no joke in Age of Sigma. I see that on the table, and I ain't even, I ain't even tripping about being able to do 12 mortal wounds in one, one round. <laughs> I'm like, yo, that guy has to die or he's going to kill my whole army. Like in uh, Lion King, he's going to eat us. That is the most intense scene in the Lion King. That's I'm basically like, what everybody should do if they line right. up against the well, star. Poor Pumbaa is hauling ass and stupid freaking knowledge chasing him down and he gets stuck under that stupid branch and he's like literally the fear in his eyes when he's talking to Timon, she's going to eat me. Like that, I, as a kid, I was like, that bitch is going to eat him. Like, I believe that shit. I believe Puma was going to fucking die at that moment. Oh, uh, yeah. But I'm sure that Star Trek's going to look fresh, yo. Oh, yeah. I feel, it's I feel a great that every moment. time I see a Star Trek. I relive that. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's my consolation prize because I can't afford Smaug. I really want no, Smaug, but, I, but that's painful. Yeah, how, he's expensive, isn't he? He's five hundred dollars. <laughs> Turns out, like, mm, I'm probably expensive. not going to do it. Seems like a lot of fucking dollars. Apparently, it doesn't come with that base either. Like you have to literally cut down sprue to make all those coins. That's what they did. Like that's not part of it. <laughs> I don't know, Rob. Do you remember uh, back at the FTW store here when you were there? I, I used to mm -hmm. bring um, Alduin on on a tower as my chaos dragon. Oh yeah. Yeah, you can you can find ways not to spend five hundred dollars on a Sorry. giant dragon. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. You know, uh, BTTQ, uh, Lucas, he got some Chaos Dwarfs all painted up for Age of Sigmar, and he did a really good job with those. And those things shoot the crap out of everything. I was like, ouchies. If you yeah, had, like, you that beat, I mean, we got more Age of Sigmar dropping like in a Beats Lab soon. Yeah, um, I certainly certainly hope so. That's the that's the plan. I mean, obviously, anyone listening to this knows that we missed uh, we missed. Star battle report this Monday, hurricane. Enough said. She got she got real, but we'll be back in force, you know, this next Monday. Uh hopefully dropping some, you know, sick uh new tech on people. I'm hoping to see some more Age of Sigmar. I think we have a sick Tau army in the beat slab still. Yep, we got we got some stuff. We got some stuff just just chilling. Army exchange program in full force. That's funny. Yeah. Uh next time next time I'm down there, I'm bringing old uh, uh, Kinder Cat's towel army for you guys too. You should bring Kinder Cat too. I'm gonna try, man. Bring him himself. That's I gotta, uh, we'll give him a th we'll give him a shout out later on in the in the episode too. But he won um, best conversion. I know at a battle for salvation. That's nice, logical. He's pretty good. He's pretty good. All right, Haspel. Do you yeah. have? Do you have a webcast recap? 
Uh, right before doing that, though, I just wanted to highlight we've got, uh, I think it's on the 18th of October, Mordheim gets released for PlayStation and Xbox One. Oh, shit. So, mm. Don't, don't tell me. Don't anything. tell me Xbox One is getting fucking that shit. That's, that's not good for me. <laughs> yeah, and I think I, I'm not sure if Vermintide has already come out for that, for the consoles. I think it was in White Dwarf that it was coming out soon. I don't it's know if it actually dropped. And that's kind of, a, for those who don't know, the Mordheim is a pretty good port of the Mordheim game, tabletop game. Uh, Vermintide was pretty much, uh, it takes place in the end times. It's like Left 4 Dead, but with uh, but in Warhammer Fantasy. So if you like killing Skaven, that's your jam. Um, and then this week will be all about Blood Bowl as they reveal a lot more. And there's a bloodbowl.com right now is already up and they got trailer videos for a bunch of different factions, unboxing of the starter set. Like it's looking pretty fresh. Um, like if you are looking to get on board with some Blood Bowl, you need to check that out like ASAP. <laughs> But yeah, we got a webcast recap too. Yes, we do, actually. Um, we've got uh, Aaron uh, Bang asked a couple questions. One, uh, that what what brand was Kenny's light? He has this big lamp. If you've been watching his Twitch streams or the webcast, uh, he has a big lamp behind him with a diffuser on it. And he was asking what the uh, brand was on that. Uh, so it's a Genere, which is a, which is a brand of lights. Um, <clears throat> I, I, we will post a link up somewhere online here, probably on Facebook here soon. But if you're listening to this, um, it's a spectral LED. It's, it is a studio light. It is a film quality light. It's, it's an SP-E-240D. Uh, like I said, you don't have to memorize that. Um, but it's you can find it on B&H uh, for like half price, but still half price. It's still like $160, $180. Uh, but it does not come with everything else you've seen in my videos where you see it on this nice swinging arm with a counterbalance on it. That is a separate piece you have to buy. It is just the LED panel that you get for that price. You're going to have to track down your own light stand. Um, and there's some cheap ones on Amazon by like Cowboy Studio and stuff that you can get for like under 100 bucks. So, you know, all said, it's still going to be an investment. But if you're trying to break into streaming or, or doing some kind of tutorials or anything, I strongly recommend investing in light before you invest in anything else. That's something we've learned in the Beats Lab. Uh, doing these battle reports. Heck yeah, man. Lighting is key. Lighting every is, time is awesome. We, yeah, every time we were ready to buy a new camera, Bonet stepped in. That's my lady. She's in film. She would say, nope, don't do it. You don't even know how to use this camera yet. You know, buy your ass some fucking lights. Every time. So we just kept buying lights and lights and lights. And that's kind of like the Kickstarter. We most, the, the thing we bought the most of with the Kickstarter money was lights. For the I can definitely. Because the uh, second you break into LEDs, what you're paying for is not sweating your balls off. Oh my gosh, it was so hot in those rooms back in the day. Because <laughs> all we could afford was halogens. Remember that shit? Oh, dude, we're like, wait, this lamp is 25, or these lamps are 100. Hmm. Which is yes, why literally which is ha you had to drink just to survive. Yeah. yeah. It was like New Jack City. Like you had to take all your clothes. <laughs> <laughs> just <a little> <laughs> I had to like work. I had to like keep people out of the frame because they were like actually naked because it was so hot. <laughs> Do you remember that one time we filmed with our buddy uh, McCoy like at ten o'clock at night? Oh, that was when the air conditioning and the air condition on top of everything in the Durham Beats Lab ten at night. The air conditioning was busted. Oh, it was brutal. It was like eighty-eight degrees in there, dude, at ten a at ten p.m. Oh man, I was so shot. That was a brutal summer. Yep, and that's right when we were changing the location, so we had to like film like ten battle reports before to support the change. So we were just in there like every day, just dying of dehydration. Oh, that was so bad. So, so more of the story is get your ass some cold lights, get your ass some nice high quality LEDs. Yep, without a doubt. Then like, have a work and a functioning AC system. Yes, get too far. <laughs> All these things are uh, in. All right, our next question came from uh, Jim in four two eight. Uh, how many times can the spell familiar be used? And he's referring to the chaos codex. Uh, One million times. <laughs> once a phase or with every cast? Every cast. Yep. Yes, and it's, um, it's, and it's powerful. Like we said, it's one of the things that makes, it's one of the chaos exclusive things that makes chaos, is, chaos good. Like chaos is about support and about combos and the spell familiar fits right in with 7th edition uh, psychic powers. It's like, it's so good. Now it might be under costed, uh, because it was originally designed for the old way of casting psychic powers. 
when we didn't have these amazingly ridiculous psychic powers that we have now where psychic powers are harder to cast now. Uh, so the points you, might be a little on the cheap side for what they actually wanted to do. But I feel like they gave us a break because chaos, because we, we're not that good. Yeah. <laughs> I'd have to agree with that. I mean, yeah, if, if you could give another faction the same power, it should be 30-ish points. Truth. Uh, Aaron had another question. Um, he asked, any suggestions for Gene Stealer familiars? And, and I think mm. there are some Gene Stealer familiars, actually, right? Like some actual yeah. GW. Yeah, they come with the brute code. Okay. 60, $60 box, though. So yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Maybe that's why he's asking. I guess you could use some of the stuff if you can bid some out of the uh, Silver Tower, maybe. Hmm. Oh, I mean, even Overkill, like you and I have been talking about Overkill the last couple of weeks. Like, if you're mm -hmm. trying to get, you know, like, because Austin's been preaching his Gene Steeler Call Army with the Aberrants, and the Aberrants are only available in the Overkill box. Yeah, yeah right like, now, you, you need uh, at least two of those those Overkill boxes just to run my list. So, but here's the thing, guys. The Overkill box, if you're going to start a Call Army anyway, the overkill, the overkill box comes with like, you know, sixty four dollars in neophyte hybrids, ninety six dollars in acolyte hybrids. Comes with a sixty dollar box of brood coven. Comes with the kill team casties, which is also valued at sixty five dollars. And for aberrants, which we don't have a price tag, but if you compared them to the cost of an acolyte hybrid, GW sells five of those for forty bucks. The aberrants are obviously more baller than that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're saying four aberrants at least 40 bucks, at least 50 bucks. And so when it's all said and done, you've got over $300 with the things in here, including $65 with a kill team that you can just flip on, on eBay and go toward your next overkill a kill box. You know what I mean? So like if you're looking for aberrants, overkill is actually pretty tight if you're trying to collect some jeans to the cult right now. I agree. I think whatever you can get your hands on, you should get it. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Like, there's some really good stuff available out there. Even some of the bundles that you know from GW. Like, hey, you get a you know you get a Chimera and a squad of shop troopers. You know, you get this. You know, you, you know, there's there's deals to be had. You just gotta look for them. You know. Yeah, and so, it comes with those two rando pure strains that I didn't even talk about in there. No, instant spell familiars or instant familiar uh, juicy familiars. Oh sure. Um, Cut them up. <laughs> and I. I Real quick, if anybody is on the fence about the aberrants and what they can do, I'm just I play test some games, and it turns out strength ten is good. <laughs> it's on this set. <laughs> turns out it's been good for a long time. Anytime you can get it, you should you yeah. should think about it. That instant that's out a lot of things that don't get you know because it turns out you don't get cover saves from getting smashed in the face. I mean, as simple a thing as turning feel no pain off on a Death Star. That's huge. Mm -hmm. but making when you make a chat to master fail a three up save the worst thing next is him making his five like you can't that, that's not the math you want to be up against you want to be up to you want to be up the raw dog math and at the very least turning off field of pain is one of the best parts what i'm actually loving about the gene stealers is obviously their psychic powers and what they have access to if i'm running up against a very tough three up feel no pain you know death star then all my psychers are going to roll until I get an enfeeble, you know, and then my whole army can kill them, basically. Um, enfeeble is definitely one of the strongest things. You just got to always remember, always remember this, guys. If, you're, if enfeeble is your game plan to go against a Death Star, that Death Star has a shield to turn on it, always factor that in before you allot the amount of dice you're slinging at this melody. Yeah, because they can roll against it. Because if better. They, they block like they're a psyker, and if they have a psyker, they're going to block on a four. No, oh, no doubt. It's it's uh, no, always, always, always that's the pro tip. Always factor that in before you say I'm gonna throw five dice at a feeble, and and when you recognize they can block on a four as well, always double that number of dice. You know what I'm saying? Oh, no doubt. Like I had actually play tested this exact scenario, and it turns out I have eight dice plus d6, and they're all getting rolled <laughs> on in feeble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, sir. We, we ended up charging from three different angles on his Death Star. Um, so th I got to bypass the Shield Eternal. It was kind of neat. That's the best part about all this gangster outflanking is you, is you can put your unit where, you, where he doesn't want it to be. Maybe where the Apothecary is hiding. And maybe you don't even need him, people, <laughs> the next turn, you know, because it might take two turns. You know, it's, it's clutch. And also, we do have a little intel because we did talk about GC the Colts last week. And how the cult ambush rule is basically outflank. And you, you were talking a little bit last week about how you didn't think servo skulls did anything, but you were telling me today 
you have a different opinion th- this week? <laughs> I do. Um, after playing it and reading it and, and, and kind of figuring out how it works, um, in lieu, I think it is in lieu of infiltrating. So that would affect um, – service goals would affect the cult ambush on turn one. Um, that's not set in stone, but I'm leaning towards that. Um, it probably does need – um, an answer slight clarification because it does mm-hmm. it does seem like it's going to lean that way which means six several skulls will stop a gene sailor call army in that scenario from uh, any kind of first turn charge just the first turn yeah it'll definitely force them into a let's reserve try to survive and, and then do it turn two change yeah. a game plan be aware that as a gene sailor uh, cult player not every game uh, is going to be i every, set up it should be it should and that's what's fun about it is every opponent we talked about it. Every opponent has an option to not get tabled by Gene Steelers, turn one, and it forces Gene Steelers players to be more open-minded to let's play a different game, let's try something else. You know, you're not just going to line up and hurt someone's feelings with this yeah, army. I, I stand by what we said last week. Gene Steelers is is, is a shift. It's a um, – what, what did you call it, Haspel, last week? What was the term? Oh, I, I don't remember. Matter Buster? An adjustment or something like that. Or yeah, like correction. Yeah. Course, course correction. correction, yeah, that's right. It, it, it's, it seems like Gene Silicon is a 40K course correction, which I like. I don't see how you can't say that. That's not oh, accurate. I'm with that. I'm with that. And All right. Our Sorry. last, Yeah, our last question, and this is a biggie, uh, was from Ty Winning. He was asking, how do you grow the community when the friendly local game store doesn't care um, at all about wanting to grow the community. This is, sen- like this is a censored games. version of what he asked. <laughs> yeah, he, he put it a little bit more colorfully than that. Mm-hmm. Um, and and my answer to be, and I'm assuming he's probably got a, an FLGS that that cares about card games, you know, Magic and stuff like that, and doesn't really care about the war game. And uh, my advice would be uh, to do something like a an escalation league where everybody has to buy their stuff at the store, you have to basically uh, show that store owner that war ge- that he can make revenue. On, you have to make him. Game. You have to show him. You have to make him care. Like, yeah, you have to make him care. So it's like when somebody comes in all of a sudden and you guys are doing an escalation league and everyone's buying their stuff there and he sees that bump in his wargaming stuff. Hey, I just made this much money this month off forty k. Um, he's gonna start caring. But honestly, the, the game stores, they run on such thin margins, you know. Um, you can't, true. You can't yeah, be having I, the folks buying stuff on eBay and then bringing it to the store. He's not going to care about I that. have some good input on this, I think, um, with just my area here. Um, you know, we had a void for a while where basically all the competitive players stopped showing up. Um, so, yeah, we had a break between kind of fun players and competitive players. And to, the effort to bring them all back together, it, it comes from us. So we just took it into our, you know, it was our job to do it. So don't expect the store to, to, to care as much as you do. So if, if it's really important to you, you're going to have to make the effort, um, set up the events and, and do the things like that to bring it back. But first, you know, one, one of my pieces too, I would say exactly what you're doing, but sometimes you got to find a guy, you got to get a spokesperson. Sometimes, you got to find, there's always some guy floating around the game store that everyone likes more than everyone else. I would say it is integral to your, to your plan to make him like 40 K too. Like that's, that's just something I've seen. Like if you can get that motherfucker to like 40 K people are going to fall in line because that guy is emphatically and enthusiastically going to fucking drive it home and he's going to get people rallied. Always find that guy and make him like 40 K too. Cause then the rest is going to fall in the line. Oh, I definitely agree with that. But um, in lieu of that, if it's going to be tough to start wherever you are, whoever asked the question, um, find a group of guys that feels the same way you do. Um, that's where it starts. Doing it by yourself seems like a, a steep hill to climb. So there's probably other like-minded people willing to help you. And start them on something small like Kill Team. Then go from Kill Team, especially now with the new box. You know what I mean? They can split it or whatever. They get the rule books. You start with Kill Team from Kill Team. You know, you buy if you buy another squad, now you're playing combat patrol. That's funny you yeah. say that. I had, had the same conversation. Um, kill team and combat um, patrol has kind of taken over. Um, it, it, it's competing with like Infinity and Malifaux and things like a smaller board you can play on a four. Wow, board. I never even thought of that. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. um so like new people like guys off the street are coming in and they're looking at 
you know, all of our painted armies and they're talking about, they kind of like that kind of stuff. They don't know where to start. Kill team is the, the best thing to do. You're like, well, pick some cool dudes and we'll show you, roll some dice with you. And, it, you know, and now take- GW has like all these pre-made kill teams that other people mm-hmm. play in the store in a GW HQ. And like, they're, I got all these like fluff lists behind them. And now they have like a make your own kill team section on their website. Kill team and is a, sick. They got a four by four mat for it. Uh, as well, we're not yeah. going to talk about the mat because the mat pisses me off. This oh, okay. All right. <laughs> me and I've been talking about the mat. It's like, yo, they didn't they were they didn't want to change their box size, so instead they released a video on how to iron your mat. <laughs> they, oh, pull this wow. mat up in a box. Get out of here! Jesus. So many flavors, and you choose to be so salty. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Yo, so we did some we did some math a while back, and I'm not sure if this was the same exact math, but this might be new new better error math. I don't, I don't math so well sometimes, but if you look at the traditional uh, game, game tables, four by six at any game store, and you figure three feet on each side and two feet on the left and right, you know, on the short side, there's basically the amount of space that a, that a game table, a footprint in a game store, right, takes up. Like, if you multiply that out, that's 24 square feet for a game table and enough room for people to maneuver around it, basically. If you do the math on that, you got um, or equals 24. So you're looking at a seven, seven by 10. You're looking at 70 square feet. OK, for that for that table, rather. So it's 70 square feet, assuming that your local game store has a decent rent rate, like say, say $13 a square foot. That's uh, that's a pretty aggressive rate but i think a lot of stores as you can imagine are aren't exactly in the best location so maybe it's more maybe it's less that's kind of the middle of the road uh for instance like a um uh high traffic uh populated areas probably around 29 30 dollars a square foot uh there's a new games workshop store in uh um short point virginia that's probably up around 30 dollars a square foot for a 1500 square foot store so now you do the math out and you basically get at 13 dollars you're looking at uh, times 70, you're looking at $910 for a square foot. And that is per year. So you divide that down by 12, you get about $75 a month is how much that game store costs. Just being there, you have to generate, just to break even, $75 in sales. But per, per table. Per, per table, right. So per and month. that's, per, and that's $75 just, per table per month. Per table per month. And that's just to break even. But if you're breaking even, you're not, you're not banking. Business. You're not paying any expenses. You're not paying employees. You make you're 66% not, profit minimum. Right. So you need to multiply that by three, basically. And now you're talking $225 a month just for that in sales, just to support having one four by six game table in your store and be profitable. I'll think about that math for me. Yeah, I love I love it when you broke that down for us like last year. Like yeah, it's pretty nuts. It's it, it is, and that's at there. That's a, that's like at the middle of the road average square footage rate. You know that is a that's an eye opener for me, man. Like to think about each table represents that much money to 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 be profitable. Oh, it's, and that, that's what it takes to be a successful store owner too. Is just to understand the concept. Um, it's why it really sh- it should hurt your feelings when the guy bought the bought his toys down the street and then using your facility <laughs> um, to play with stuff. You really need to have an open dialect, and uh, the customer needs to understand this as well. I mean, well, look, I, I have I have no. <laughs> uh, I am definitely known to being heavy handed on the internet. I was also heavy handed in my store. I uh, Austin knows I banned somebody that bought uh, China cast Titans in into the store. Um, I was like, they're banned. You can't bring them in. And they gave me a bunch of stance a sass about it. And I was like, look, you could have gone over the shelf. You just cost me a lot of money. And I was like, I get it. People buy you stuff off eBay. That's fine. And you're a walking billboard for fucking. For yeah. China for go online and buy your shit and come here and not buy the shit from the yeah. store. I had nine, nine game tables in my store. Now do that math. How much money did I need to do? In and sales? You, didn't pay, you did not pay no $13 a square foot neither. No, actually I did. I, I had a really good lease. Oh, that's right. You had like a 10 year lease. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Long story short, but anyways, so yeah, I banned him. Those type of people that come to game stores with stuff they bought off the internet or, you know, recast and things like that. Uh, that's, that's a problem for folks. That's a problem. And I honestly don't see the traditional game store 
um, uh, I guess, um, business plan going forward in the next 10 years, I really see it having to change as, you know, you go into, think about this, you go into any game store or not, not game store, excuse me, you go into any store, any store, like for, for instance, today, I walked into Macy's and I was like, hey, I need to buy some stuff. Well, guess what? Uh, this particular thing I need to buy, I have to come to Macy's to buy it because I can't buy it online because they will cut off people that try to sell the stuff online. This other thing I want to buy, it's the same price if I buy it online, if I buy it in the store. That's literally how it's going. Like you can always get 10 to 20% off your stuff online, whether it's, you know, whether it's gaming or whatever. And stores that adapt to that model and give something back to their customers will last longer in the long run than stores that sell at full price, the end, always, period. No doubt. And the thing is, we're not saying don't buy things online. We're saying don't buy mm -hmm. exclusively online because, the, you know, there's entire business models. Like in game stores, most game stores also sell online because well, they, they, they realize that that's the market and they're not going to change the market by, by banning people for buying online. What, what you're doing is you're saying, come on, man, don't buy everything online, homie. If like, you have a policy in place at your game store, such as I did, where if you, you basically got 20% off your, your products, the same as you would get from buying the war store, buying from frontline, buying from wherever at the time, buying from spiky bits at the time. It's the same price, whether you did it online or you did it in the store. That's my crazy. favorite thing you do. I've told it to so many, so many business owners out here, how you need to incentivize the right. FL, your local game store. You need to incentivize it in some way that it reflects the market. And right. you a very clever way. You're and now with that math I just did, like, Think about it. You have to spend $225 to justify that one gaming table in the store. And for all those people out there, well, you know, I bought my supplies. I bought my paints there. Yo, it paints $4 a pot. How many paints do you think a store, and that's full retail, that's not counting profit. How many paints do you think a store has to sell to compensate for having that one game table in their store? Like it's, it's a net, it's a non-winning battle. So, you know, I'm not trying to get all down on folks. I'm just kind of telling you how it is. I really see the meta shifting for the business plan of a traditional game store going in the future, because you really have to be cognizant of stuff online. Again, you can't do anything about used stuff on eBay. People are always going to get good deals on eBay for used stuff. But if your store sells at a discount, there is no reason not to buy new and box stuff from your game store, then going online to buy it. Like if it's the same thing. Now I realize there's a lot of bad apples out there and they might not get stuff in and you might not trust them. I get it. I understand there's all sorts of extenuating circumstances. I'm talking about the good guys out there. And you know, um, a lot of you probably know who they, you know, a lot of you have a good gaming store experience. Some of you might not. And you know, at the end of the day, you vote read the dollars. Mm, good story. I truly appreciate it. I know this is something you have a big dog in the fight. In. <laughs> I, I have a lot to say about gaming stores. I know Let me you tell do. you. I know you do. Well, we should take a commercial break yes. and then come back in and talk about Battle for Salvation. Dear veterans, quickly, make your way to the longwar.net and find out how to reap your hard-earned spoils of this long war. For our allies at Dicehead.com have rewarded us all with an extra 6% discount on all Dicehead.com merchandise. So stock up, dear veterans, and enjoy. Dear veterans, quickly, make your way to the longwar.net and find out how to reap your hard-earned spoils of this long war. For our allies at secretweaponsminiatures.com have rewarded us all with an extra 10% discount on all Secret Weapon Miniatures merchandise. So stock up, dear veterans, and enjoy. And we're back, Austin, reporter on the scene. Break it down. Battle for Salvation. Battle for Salvation. Uh, New York. About 50 people. Um, my crew drove up, you know, left at 1230, got there right when the doors opened, didn't sleep, started drinking. Um, good crowd. So you got uh, all, basically the whole East Coast crowd was there. So we got a lot of good faces. And I know we, we wanted to talk about some of the, the good and the bad that we that we saw there. So I'll start with my experience. Um, I brought renegades with some demon allies, um, did very well. Um, 
You did really I, well on Nova too with your with your list, right? I did. Uh, I, I wish we had some. I had a mess up. I, I brought an ITC list and it was Nova Construction, so I had to change it right before I played round one. Um, and I wish I brought my extra Titan. I just sort of took my Nova list that I did so well with. But um, I got to play some some more demons and got to do some of the shenanigans from Curse of the Wolfen. So that, that was fun. Uh, yeah, you of, had your paradox cube and everything. Yeah, you had a paradox. You know, had uh, I, I had one game against a Tau player. Poor guy. I summoned like fifteen units during the game. That seems like a lot. I had th- yeah. We'll check this. Out. I had three incursions. So it was like every turn was just like blood crushers, blood crushers, blood crushers. Um, turns so. out t- turns out I won. I won that game. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we wanted to talk a lot about um our buddy DeFrance's list. I played him round one and he ended up winning the tournament. He was obviously playing some Eldar uh, jetpack spam, right? He put the Eldar on the shelf. Okay. So he, he had a Gladius strike for us. He did not. He, he took, had a Death Star. Space Super Friends Death Star. He didn't. <laughs> wait no, a he brought wait, out wait, what? the classic DeFranza Raven Guard list. Pure Raven Guard. So he took the, the classic, new- classic innovation by DeFranza, but not a yeah. classic list. No, no, it was very, very off the wall. Uh, very cool. It was, it was utilizing the new Decurion for Raven Guard. Um, I believe that was in the Angels of Death book. Is that right? If you guys mm-hmm. back on that. Yeah. Do we have the, uh, do we have the names of these, these, these uh, formations, Rob? So he's probably running the Shadow Strike Kill Team, which is two to four scout squads, one to three veteran squads that they get to, instead of rolling to see whether... Uh, Vanguard, you, Vanguard vets, right? Yeah, Vanguard vets. Instead of rolling to see if the formation arrives from reserve, you choose to pass or fail. And when they come in from reserve uh, by a deep strike, they do not scatter. And as long as the first model is placed within... Wait a minute. Uh, if they're near the scouts, they don't scatter, but they can assault the turn they arrive from deep strikes. Um, can charge on the turn they arrive from deep strike. Yep, within and they don't scatter if they're within nine inches of the squad. So you're, you're already talking three Vanguard veteran squads that can assault you. Now we're talking. We've seen a lot of things that can assault you the turn they come in. Cool, 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 cool. Um, I, I don't see the the, the gangsterness yet, but I hear that there's something else that, that that you can do with this to carry on those. What you were saying, Austin, right? Yes. So I, I believe well, he had- that's, that's an that's an auxiliary to to a to a to carry on, right? That yes, is... yes, that was part of the the you have to take uh, that juiciness to take his army. So I believe that that may be the core if Rob's checking it. Um, yeah, 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 my book is maybe the core. The looting, but um, he had walk, two, us, walk us through this the theme. The theme of the list. He had about two of those. He had about six of the deep striking vanguard guys, and he he equipped the majority of them with power fist and the lightning claw on each of them. So Vanguard so, Veteran has two base attacks, has three now for the specialty weapons stacked, four on the charge because they have no restrictions on the assault bonus, no disorderly crap. So four attacks each. Correct. Either with the lightning claw to clear out infantry or with the power fist to clear out everything else. Very true. And the Decurion allows him to obviously start on turn one with all of this. Which... So the Decurion has a special rule. It lets you roll for reserve starting on turn one. Oh, auto pass it. How about that? Yeah. It turns so, out that he gets to bring all potentially six of these units you think he had. I think six. He had four scouts Oof. and six of them. So they all came on um, turn one automatically. And then he has a roll. Well, he, arc- probably, he probably had two cores then. He probably had, because I think it's a max. No, these are auxiliary and they're just one plus, it looks like. So you, you can had take, to have a core yeah. of either a battle demo company or opinion battle demo company. So, so that makes sense. So I think he took two auxiliaries of two scouts, three vanguards. Cause the, I think the most you can have is three vanguard. So right. it looks like, so I think he stacked this auxiliary twice over a lighter version of the core to get you those six vanguards in your grill. Yeah. So turn one, it looked funny. He also has as an auxiliary, um, the formation with the Storm Raven and two Storm Talons. The Storm Wing formation, I think? Or? Storm Wing. So they, they also were able to roll turn one due to the Decurion. This is a great formation. I love this formation. They're also using Fighter Ace rules, and these guys already have um, Strafing Run in the formation. So all manner of manipulation and a lot of firepower. And I've always said, the only thing I don't like about Flyers is how they – that's an amazing part of my army that doesn't never get to be on the table turn one. He completely took that out of the game. 
yeah. said, no, they can be on the table turn one. And additionally, I get to set up like I'm a drop pod army. Like there's no, there's like no threat of any issues happening. No, if, no, nothing was deployed turn one. Um, like, and like you said last week, you said one of the be- one of the strongest ways to play 40K is to be able to go second with the confidence of not getting tabled or getting alpha struck. Yeah, not getting shot at all is super strong. Um, kind of dictating how you want the game to go because it's all up to you. You're always going first and you always get the last turn. Um, very strong. Yeah, so, you get the best of both worlds, man. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. It's very good. So the way he had it set up, he also had some servo skulls in there for uh, Inquisitor. Inquisitor to help his deep striking because he's, he was very, I mean, he's very ballsy. Um, if he thinks he can table you, Turn one, like that's what he's going for. It's a competitive game. And, and additionally, it doesn't hurt to help uh, to stop people from scouting up on you or infiltrating up on you. Absolutely. Um, the skulls are just good. They're just good. Um, so he was able to, against me, um, basically land everything, get a bunch of hits, multi-charge. The, uh, the jump packs are coming so clutch when you can hop over um, – you know, you you can bubble wrap all you want, but like if a five man squad can can hop over and stay coherent, like they charged your whole army. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he had some good charge rolls, was able to charge everything, and um, we ended up calling it pretty early. But because um, you, I mean, you have a bunch of wyverms in a box and uh, a bunch of zombies trying to bubble wrap those, and he was able to completely mitigate the power of your army very fast. Very fast, and again, him being able to – he went first, so no psychic – if I had some psychic buffs up, um, maybe a different story, but the, the way it rolled out, um, not, not really much of a chance there. It was kind of just pucker up in the corner and, and hope he doesn't table me. Um, I tried to keep some stuff in reserve uh, and try to play it cute. I think if I just deployed everything, I may have – well, we may have actually played a game. Um, <laughs> not, yeah, you're not saying you would have won or anything. No, but no. He, 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 was a, he probably was going to win, but we, I may have gotten some more points than zero. <laughs> zero is a lot. Is not that many. <laughs> yeah, so zero was bad to start the tournament, and um, like I said, I was playing with a knight down. So my original. Well, list, I mean, he, he got through an amazing player. You're one of the best, and he said he also got through Kelsey. Yeah, he played Kelsey in the the, the top bracket um, day two. Um, was able to. Sneak through and kill all Kelsey's psychers, and, and Kelsey had a hard time dealing with the number of units. I know it was a, it's always a bloodbath when you play the tripartite. Um, but yeah. he, he came out on top uh, there as well. You're able to make those lances stay on their side of the table for like three turns. It's one unit is the problem with the tripartite. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot of its strength, too. But if it doesn't have the psychic augmentation, it's now a weakness because now the whole unit has to stay in one place to deal with these threats that he can feed it one by one. Um, and Defonz is definitely the caliber of a, of a player to know exactly how to do that. Oh, yeah. I think Kelsey, Kelsey may have had a miss. He mistook something. where Misdeployed probably a little he, bit. He allowed um, DeFranz's flyers came on and shot all the strength eight missiles. And – Kelsey forgot the rule where their negative one ballistic seal when shooting at the Heralds of the Grey Wolf. So oh. it turns out they all missed, um, but because they're even, BS. Even with the, even with the, the strafing run? Because, well, Kelsey had them, um, yeah, they strafing run at BS5. So the guy, he rolled like a bunch of twos. Oh, and still, and still got the hits through. And still got a bunch of hits through and was able yeah, to. That's an, that's an obscure rule. I forgot about that rule too. <laughs> Well, it's funny. Mm-hmm. Kelsey, he always talks about becoming invisible and then being your BS zero. Um, and then when, he forgot his own shit. And then he forgets his own shit. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, you don't. I feel like there was alcohol involved. Uh, actually, it was the game one day, day two. So that was his excuse was he wasn't drunk. He's like, God damn it. My normal thing. Wow. Okay. That was his excuse. Yeah. So I don't know. So DeFranz ended up going through and then obviously, you know, played every Eldar player ever ended up playing against them. Um, Sean Naden, um, had another a, amazing player who wins a lot of tournaments. Had a great, I forget. I actually couldn't tell you what Naden's list was. Cause it was a bunch of trees with guns taped to him. Um, mm. yeah, which will lead us, which will lead us into a new segment eventually. Of, <laughs> Damn dog. Really? Yeah. Like, wow. Come on, man. You're one. Of, you're a community leader, Doug. Um, but that's, see, just, oh, that's, just, that's just what it's support. That's just what the the competitive scene supports, though. So, Otaris uh, says the guy that won Battle for Salvation had one demo company with no upgrades at all, a Shadow Strike kill team, which we just talked about. 
Then the formation with two Storm Talons, one Storm Raven, and the Inquisitor. So the Shout Strike kill team can have three of those Vanguard veteran squads. And then if you had a demo company, all that shit's scoring. So he did it with so he so he did it with one uh, auxiliary. Apparently, yeah, I, so I don't know. There's oh, a, man, oh, you know what? He just took him ten man strong and combat squatted him. Oh, that's why there were six. Yo. that's why there were six. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And, yep. and, and I knew it was a battle demi company. They can take the legitimate demi company. So now he's mm-hmm. got all these upgrade. Like, literally, you're saying I have three five man tactical marine squads in a rhino. I've got a devastator squad in a rhino, and he probably had the minimum attack bike. Uh, says no upgrades, so yeah, and and a also objective secured uh, fucking chaplain or some shit. Like, yeah, literally mm-hmm. all the tools to win the game, while all the tools to stop you from winning the game. Yep, it's yeah, like it the best of both super, worlds. Super solid list. He's a great guy. Did a did, obviously did a great job with it. Um, coming coming soon to the West Coast. <laughs> no doubt. I would like to give a shout He's out nice. to all the all the other guys. I know um, Ganyo did great with his Tau. Got um, Battlemaster again. He he was um, he got Renaissance Man here actually. He actually got the biggest award in my opinion. Um, I know. That, and that's actually and that DeFranz himself is no stranger to the Renaissance Man. The guy's a great hobbyist on top of everything. So yeah, some of his other race lines are there. bananas. Solid, solid dude, all in all. So I'm glad you guys had a great trip. I we know did, we did the the wobbly modelers came out with a modeling awards. I know Kelsey got best painted miniature. Kinder got best conversion. So good, congrats to them. That's sick. That's sick, man. I don't want to eat up this entire podcast without talking about our our meat and potatoes. Yeah, for real. Um, so eighth edition. Uh, obviously rumored to be on the horizon. A lot of people have a lot of things to say about it. Recently, it came out, the big rumor on the street, take it for what it's worth, add your salt pills, is that there will be very similar mechanics to hit and to wound with no sliding chart and no toughness value, very similar to Age of Sigma, which, mm-hmm. as Kenny will tell you, that really goes a long ways to kind of go along with what we'd be saying about toughness all along in vehicles. Um, yeah, there's like, you know, Obviously, we this is all conjecture, like pure 100% speculation. We're not, every, everything we're about to say is 100% opinion, 100% con- totally based on what we've seen, things that we may know about how GW thinks, uh, th- you know, mistakes they've made in the past, uh, fixes to those mistakes. And uh, Haswell brought something up real earlier uh, in response to that I had said on the, on the webcast where I was like, well, I mean, that'd be tight. I'd, I'd be really happy to see that. And he just straight shut me down. He's like, no, they're not going to do it. Yeah, they'd have to invalidate like 20 plus books. But what if they just say, yo, if you're Ballistic Seal 4, you hit on fours? Do you think I'm, that they would do I'm that? I'm with Haspel, like, dude. There's no piece. way it's happening. There's no way they can do that. I'm 100% it's happening. It is happening, but I don't think it's going to be soon. Like, I, I think oh. uh, I think they're going to play out this Black Crusade thing. Oh, yeah, totally. Totally. Okay. They're going to, they're going to, okay. I feel like, and I'm sorry to cut you off there, but I just just got this fucking light bulb just went off in my head. Like, I really feel like this whole Black Crusade slash Warzone Fenders thing is very similar, and don't take this at face value when I say End Times series of books, but it's very similar because remember the same thing happened. Like, we had all these books come out that got everybody hype, all these supplements, all this dope shit, and then boom, we got the new edition. But I, but I think they've learned their lesson, and don't worry, it's not going to go the way it went with Age of Sigmar, but this is very eerily similar to the events of 2014, to me at least. Oh, that, yeah, it, it comes across as that. Uh, I just don't, like, they, they're putting out, you know, there's, there's rumors out that they're going to be putting out a new chaos book for each, for each kind of faction, you know, for each legion or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so it's like that we're already at more than 20 bucks, I think. And that would be another four. So I, I just don't see them just going, Hey, you know, this is all gone. Um, and you know, to start speculating a little bit, what I would like to see, and this is completely just something I want to see. I want to see on day one of eighth edition, you know, wherever it drops, it's either in the rule book or a general's handbook type, you know, uh, supplement on day one of release because that will cut down on the saltiness immediately. Mm-hmm. And, and I would just like to see two things, like a veteran rule set, which is pretty much 40K as it is now with a bunch of stuff maybe cleaned up. And then what I would call an evolved rule set, which would be new stuff, streamlined rules, 
um, incorporating the kind of Age of Sigmar kind of uh, evolutions that we've seen. But along with that, and I'm, I'm covering a bunch of stuff because I'm going to have to jet here and go to work. <laughs> but uh, I, I would like to see them get rid of Hugo Igo. Um, I would like to see them either go to like a Lord of the Rings system where both uh, players an, an move, activation system, right, or an activation system like AOS or Malifo, or like Lord of the Rings used to have, where both players moved, both players shot, both players assaulted. So it was still kind of you go I go, but you didn't get to go through every game, you know, every phase of the turn without the opponent responding. See, I like that, man. I think that, I, I like what Age of Sigmar does now in the combat but I'd like to see that expanded to every phase. True. Like, yep. you know, I think that that I right out mm-hmm. the gate, it would be game changer. Like just to, just to see it go to every phase, you know, like you go, I go, you go, I go, you go, I go. That would be such a, but you're right. But yeah, I think you guys are hundred percent right, man. I, I just don't, I think you're right. They're not going to do it, but I do think that they're going to do something to walk us down the road. To there might be a training wheels rule set for a while. To eventually eliminate all everything and replace well, it. I tell you what, what it is. I'm gonna jump in here because Rob, you're talking about end times for mm-hmm. Warhammer Fantasy. So I was all about it. I still am. I, I mean, I love the old fantasy and everything. Oh yeah. So the this, this is what I thought was going to happen. I thought they were going to have the end times. Then they were going to come out with Age of Sigmar, and then they were going to bring back Warhammer Fantasy Battles again. So. Fantasy battles would be your veteran rule set that Hass was talking about. Age of Sigmar would be the more, mm. you know, basic starter set. That's what I wanted to happen. I wanted Age of Sigmar and Warhammer Fantasy battles to coexist. It hasn't happened. Oh man, what a, what an interesting I, perspective. But there, there's um, no reason it couldn't. They could even come out with a supplement like the General's Handbook was to port all that stuff over. Come out with square base packs. Come out with adapter I'm packs. Just, come I'm out just with you know, like. That is my hopes and dreams have been sitting since 2014 that they're going to come out with ninth edition Warhammer fantasy battles. Cause they didn't, they didn't call age of Sigmar Warhammer. They called it age of Sigmar. You know, mm-hmm. it is not the same game. It's not even close to the same game. Sure. It uses the same models um, to some extent, but Warhammer fantasy battles is still in my heart and still alive, but they haven't done anything with it. So if they do, would I be cool with them bringing that to 40K? I mean, obviously, that'd be the greatest thing ever. If we could have 40K the way we, we know and love it now and a simpler, more um, refined version, kind of like Age of Sigmar, I mean, I don't see how that hurts anyone's feelings and everybody's happy. But. True story. Yep, for without a doubt. Haswell left some notes here for us. So he's saying, uh, I would like to see two sets of rules for them to phase out, modify the rules by cutting down on the saltiness and avoid it. And, uh, invalidating 20 plus books. We covered that already. General's handbook type decks, e- either in the rule book or on day one of release. We covered that already. Veterans rule set. We pretty much covered that already. Evolved rule set, new stuff, streamline rules, initiative roll at the start of the turn, like AOS, Lord of the Rings. Uh, get rid of you go, I go. It's either like Lord of the Rings where players move, both players shoot, both players assault, or go to activation base. Like this will, be, this will be a good post to put on Facebook right here. Yeah, definitely. Um, Gaming has evolved. The cards like the War Scrolls data slates, a.k.a. the gaming aids. Uh, no points on the cards. But that way, you know, you can basically construct your army and have your quick references. Now, something I did notice is if you're buying this stuff new, they are going to come with little data cards of various sizes on the instruction manual. So you can cut those out, save those, bring them out with your army books, slap them on the table. Um, I think the biggest point here is don't kill the fluff, advance the clock. Like story wise, I suppose. Well, I believe that's what they're kind of doing. I hope. I mean, mm-hmm. they're they're making some moves. You know, I think that um, to turn it into a bit of a debate for a minute, um, I personally think that f- the way we play 40k right now is definitely more involved, more role play, more in depth. It it's like it's like you know a macro. Like if you like if, you know like you know when you when you zoom back and you play um, Epic, you're playing a very sh- simplified version of the game, right? Go back, you know, if you, when you go in one step further, you play R40K. You're playing a more advanced version where we have, like, we know exactly how fast, how strong, how good at shooting each dude is. You know, go further to, like, how we used to play Inquisitor, you know? These dudes are D&D, you know, character sheets, practically. Mm-hmm. I think that there's absolutely a place 
um, in between Epic and 40K, you know, which is where Age of Sigmar lives in my mind for like how streamlined the rules are. It doesn't mean it's some beginner shit. It means it's, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's, it just, it means it's straight up not, we haven't gotten down to that map. We haven't, ex, you know, put the magnifying glass on the unit, on the people yet. We're still playing a little bit further back from them. We just have, you know, models that are the same size, you know, the same scale. Um, I definitely think that 40K, I wouldn't even call it like some veterans, some beginner shit. I'd see like 40K is like more role play. It's more in depth. And then if we did an Age of Sigmar style of 40K, it would be the ma- it would be the removed one step rule set, and you'd get and you'd give it some other totally different rules name, and it wouldn't even be the, the same game. You know, like I, I think that there totally is a void. I mean, look how many games they're putting out week after week, whole new games. It's not like the market can't support new games. Mm-mm, you know, the market cool actually you know the market actually doesn't support one busted ass game for fucking twenty years. Yeah, that does not work. That is not what works. What works is more. And I can't see why they wouldn't just do that. Like somebody said earlier, all these FAQs, all this shit. Do you really think these FAQs are to fix 40K? I believe in my heart that all these FAQs are putting out is to f- take the temperature for their new rule set. Whatever and that not make the same be. mistakes again, basically. Not make the same mistakes again. GW put, pe- GW put motherfuckers out of business with AJ Sigmar. Like, it's true. They, they put premier stores out of motherfucking business with these, like, you're going to get the release before anyone. You got to buy $10,000 worth of boxes and, oh, shit, I have $10,000 worth of boxes that sat on the shelf for nine months. Yeah, it was, I mean, we've made posts about it. Like, website traffic was down. Business was down. Like, it was rough for a game store. And then this year, you know, just retail in general is down. Could have something to do with election, whatever. But it's not easy for game stores out there. And we talked about a lot of stuff earlier in the show. Yeah, that you blame them for not giving a fuck about us. Yeah, I, I don't. Stupid war gamers, you know, like who don't value, you know, the commitment. We don't think about things like profit. We just want to place to play our games and have fun. And then simultaneously GW is putting out products that are unsellable. So nobody's buying them. And mm-hmm. we still want to play, and but everyone always plays Magic because fucking Wizards of the Coast puts out new shit every fucking week, and then you know Fantasy Flight puts out new shit every fucking week. Like, why the fuck are we? Why are we gonna buy shit that sucks? And why G Dub? Why are gaming stores gonna support us? Like, and you gotta you gotta pay bills, homie. Yeah, I mean it's a lot easier for people to stock Magic. To be quite honest, I mean you can fit what eight players to almost the same space as a forty k table. Those eight players are going to be spending money. You, the, the the card boxes take up what a tw- like a foot they, by six all, inches. Of they space. can all sit behind the shelf. Yeah, all behind the shelf. Like this, it, it's like it's literally sells itself. Like every pre-release that I did for Magic, it was just like, well, I know I'm going to make this much money this weekend, guaranteed. Every time it happened, never not happening. Like it was just a constant influx and turnover of cash for a game store. Whereas that doesn't happen for Games Workshop, especially when hey. Here's the new gene stealers. Oh, you're only allocated to one each. Like what? what? Like I could see where game stores would be sass- salty, sassy about that. Like, wait, you're telling me I normally sell 25 codexes and I can get one. And they're like, yeah, sorry. Like, no, 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 no. Don't call us. We'll call you. <laughs> you yeah, know what we'll I mean? call you homie. We, we're changing our business direction. That's so, but GW has learned. They've been publicly traded for a while now. They've, yep. they've changed the way they do business because now there's a, there's a different requirement of making money now. And it turns out the secret to making money is being good, is being, is being excellent. Like that's the big secret. Like you can talk about like marketing, you can talk about this, but all those things are symptoms of the same, uh, you know, thing here. The same thing is you got to put out an excellent product. You got to, you got to have an excellent camp marketing campaign. You got to have excellent designers, excellent rules creators. You got to have mm-hmm. every element needs to be excellent. And that's kind of what I've seen from GW over the last few months, restructuring, becoming more excellent, becoming greater than the sum of their parts, really seeing what other people are doing to be successful and channeling that. They make the best looking models in the business. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're all hands down. They already have that. You know, they already make, uh, until Fantasy Flight and X-Wing, they already made the the best, you know, most successful war game in the the business. You know, they, they have the tools. They just have to put them in the right place, keep channeling power through and start caring about us. And I think that's what the social media push has been. That's what the Facebook FAQ questionnaire has been. That's what their new media team is all about. What Warhammer TV is all about. They're doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're definitely, uh, they're definitely out there doing that guerrilla marketing for sure. Like working them angles and 
Uh, we saw it with the Magnus release. And I, I was actually happy a lot of people were talking about that. You know, they're like, hmm, that red surface looks like the red trash can. That guy jumped out. It yeah, most definitely is. <laughs> like, you can see the folds in the freaking trash can in the other picture. And you can even see the, 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 the piece of paper that they wrote on the trash can. You can even see it in the, in the crumpled up box picture. Like, it's a no-brainer. I've been saying they've been doing it for years. And we, we finally have proof, they, like, right there. They, and they have been lazy. Evan Valdeik is still salty about um, Angel's Blade. And oh, the lazy, yeah. And the laziness there. There is still laziness. I still believe that there's like half a dozen people in the whole fucking company that are in charge of this pro- this process. You know what I mean? It's the same thing like with Forge World where like we talk about quality control. If you spent $100,000 a year on quality control, you wouldn't have to just keep giving people free Warhound Titans in the mail. You know what I mean? But instead, they... They have a spreadsheet in their Beats Lab that says if we save $100,000 a year on quality control staff and personnel, we and we just, we, no questions asked, replacement policy, we, the difference is this, profit. Well, at some point, you as a, as a successful publicly traded business, you have to make a decision um, about that profitability. Like, if all you do as a business is care about profit, like, I'm not saying you don't care about profit, that's what business is about, but if all you care about is profit and not helping, not changing, not enriching, then you will get left by the wayside. And GW, which is we're seeing the change. They, I think we're seeing the beginnings of that change. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, which is I good. Think, I, I think I'll jump in on that. Like quality control, like I do that with Comcast, and we recently went. They went through a change. They do it every year where they cut back on quality control and just try to pump out stuff. And I'm telling you, they regret it every time when you just when you stop focusing on quality, even for a, a month or a with quarter. Somebody, because it's publicly traded, somebody on a board is saying more money, more money, more money. And they're super far removed from the boots to the ground people. Yep. And they never get to see the fallout. You know what I mean? That's why it's, that's why it's this cycle it just never stops. You know, now we know that GW, their board is not the same board it used to be. It's not the same company it used to be, but there is still a lot of red tape to, ch- to change things. You know, you have a lot of people locked in, grandfathered into a business, people who, who have, who have politically maneuvered within a hundred million dollar company to be immune to, you know, certain elements, certain restrictions. They, they're, they're calming through that. Like, they're yeah, through but that. you have to be, you have to be flexible to change, you know, like the thing when Austin's talking about like, Hey, if you're going to have an uptick in installs or whatever, you know, have an uptick in QC, get some temps on or something, you know, if you're gonna, if you're going to release a split uh, quarter of age of Sigmar and four new 40 K books, you might want to put a little bit more money in your production so you can actually produce based on your budget and your numbers. Well, let's the talk honor. about the obvious uh, elephant in the room is if you're going to come out with a new rule set and you're going to come out with new books and new armies, you should probably play test a little more. That too. <laughs> it almost feels like the, well, it's, the it's, all, it's all the same comp. It's all the same department. It's all the quality control department. You know what I mean? They but got remember, four guys. They got four guys in a beat well, lab. Like starting, the department. You don't know that now. Like a lot of people moved around. A lot of people are in different departments. They're ramping up production. They're ramping up, they're, they're ramping up projects. You know, we've seen them make some moves on Warhammer TV that we know about in the background, you know, like we, you know, they are making changes and it's hard to say the change that they made seven months ago that, that this Angel's Blade was even part of that. Like, we don't know. Like, we just don't know at this point, but we can look going forward if we keep seeing the same problems over and over, then we know that they weren't making those changes, you know, at, you know, after post holiday or whatever. Good point. Yeah. We have no idea how long in advance they have to plan for these things. And if we're still riding the coattails of old GW. I believe we still are. It's true. Well, uh, prop- no, no, proposition time. But I, I, will like, Q- I will. I will be their QC department if they hire me. I will literally do it for free. We've said it a thousand times. Um, Evan Valdek says White Dwarf Battle Reports <laughs> are their playtesting. Oh wow, that's cute. That's cute. That's <laughs> I enjoy them, but I don't know if they're the most accurate way to do it. It is. It's true though. It's horrible, man. But we would do anything. GW, literally a phone call. Like I will give you. I will give you eight hours a week for free consulting. Just hit me with it hard. Just hit me with the numbers. Like I don't even need to see anything. I don't need to see any models, any sensitive information. I'll sign any NDA you need me to sign. Literally hit me with like, hey, we're trying to move uh, Eldar jump bikes to the troop choice spot. Like word, word. Well, what's the point tax? Oh, same points. Is it still 54 points for, for three jump bikes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not feeling that dog. Okay, okay. Um, cool, cool. Should we keep him in fast attack? Yeah, I feel like you should keep him in fast attack. Like that is the, that is the phone call. You know what I mean? Simple things like that. Did you just QC Eldar? In two seconds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're 51 like, points now, by the way. Or 51, sorry, 51 points. I forgot. Oh, my God. 
you know, then if you then, okay, let's say like, let's say you didn't decide to retain my consulting, uh, uh, you know, time until after you already had fucked that up and made them true choices. Then in the second codex, you said, okay, they're already true choices. We're not going to change it. We realize it was a mistake, but we think if we let them all take star cannons or scatter lasers, it's cool. Or every other gun, I think that hold up backtrack. Don't do that. Here's how we fix it. Literally one, one per three. One per three as usual. And now Eldar jet bikes are awesome. minimum six per unit. Oh, six would help it too. Straight up. Not saying that I'm not telling you to devalue it or re, 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 or change the point cost. I'm saying minimum squad size six. Boom. That fast. Phone call over. You know what I mean? Simple set. Go, go play test that. Give me your results. Report back. It's almost like Rick and Morty. Like Rick just like telling Morty some crazy shit to run off to do. And then Morty comes back and like, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, ah, my brain's so much bigger. No, I'm, th I'm thinking about that. Like, what would that actually do? Well, that would force every Eldar jet bike unit. They're only leadership eight. And then you could make them run away. It's, um, it's, 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 it, you still, have, you still have, an you have an insanely good troop choice that now you have to pay points for instead of not, pay, not points, which at 51 points. And you can take two special weapons for the unit. That's still very good unit. It's just not this, it's not this stupid, ridiculous. Mathematically impo just, impossible to no. like. And then I, I, my second, my next phone call would be like, all right, like in your beats lab, you know, where you have that um, secret flow chart that no one gets to see that you guys have had since like 1989. That has like a flow chart of like points, breakdowns and what things cost. Like I need you to just take that and throw it in the trash. Like I don't, want, I don't want you to ever look at it again. I don't want you to ever look at that again. You always just need to call me first before you write down the points. <laughs> like, All right, you ready, Kenny? I got yeah. one for you. Lord of Skulls, go. Uh. Lord of Skulls. Okay, from now on, if you, are, if, you are, if you get a boner to the concept of having to assign a point value to a unit based on its demonic alignment number, like 888, and you're saying this motherfucker has to be 888 points. That is, we can't argue that. Like, he has to be. Then we have to make him worth 880 points. Yeah, yeah. he needs that, uh, five weapons and stomp. First rule. <laughs> and, that's, that's rule one. I'll let you come back at me with your counter offer on what you think is worth 880 points now that you've thrown away and balled it up like old ass fucking homework. You've gotten rid of it. You've gotten rid of the old flowchart. I don't want you ever looking at it again. I want you to come back at, to me with what you think 880 points is. And then we'll go from there. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Like, I'm not taking their power. I'm not going to try to take their power in this consultation relationship. I'm trying to help them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, Got to lead them to water, man. Anybody that thinks a model is worth a thousand points and does what a Lord of Skulls does, like, they need to, like, you're really bad at your job. Like, it, yep. it's actually embarrassing as somebody who supports them to try to convince somebody that, wow, this Lord of Skulls looks so cool. What does he do? And I'm like, mm -hmm. dude, if you, if you buy that, like, you can't play with it. Like, you'll actually – Never, never have fun because that's your whole army. Yeah. You know what the worst feeling is? Is having this cool shit in your army that literally sucks. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I have to do people. I mean, and some people are tough. Yes. I, I know a lot of people that are like that. Like, man, your models look so good. You and they look really good, and you did a really good job with them. But like, you know, they're terrible. <laughs> like, you know, they're overpriced. You you know that. You know they're not very good, but you take them anyway because you're stubborn, and that I, I I applaud that. But that's definitely got to be hard on you. I don't you know? want anyone to have to make that kind of sacrifice to enjoy the game. That and that would be that would be like my my intro every time they go to argue me or like and you know they're calling me. And I'm like, look, man, this is the thing. They're like, but Kenny, I was like, hey, remember what I said? I don't want anyone who plays your game to have to ever feel like they're making sacrifices to play with things they love. Like. Always hold that in your heart when you come at me with some of these points and some of these rules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that. That's simple, man. But, you know, they're never going to call me, so it's all conjecture. All right. Maybe we should call them. Let's, let's invite them yeah. on this, the podcast. Oh, with, yeah, you're right. I'll get Bonet on it. She's really good at phone calls. Ooh, that's all we need. We just need an interview. Give me Gav Thorpe. I always want to talk to him. <laughs> Gav Thorpe. What? You, you need to do me a favor. You need to take a step back real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who's the key grip on set? <laughs> oh gosh, he's Tropic Thunder. Punch that man! Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, best movie in the history of ever. Sorry, man. Uh, word, word. I think we've done it. I think we've done a good one. 
Yeah, no doubt. I was I had a lot more to say, but I looked at the time. And I was like, nope. You have a lot of dog in this fight. We I do. do. This could be a five hour podcast if we wanted to be. I have at least two dogs and possibly three cats in this fight. There's always three cats in this fight. I was <laughs> I was helping my buddy move, and one of my uh, one of my other buddies' uh, daughter was there, and she was babysitting the dog, and she's like. She's like, you're the cat guy, right? I'm like, uh. <laughs> uh, hey, you know my, you've listened to my podcast? What? No, you're just insane. I can see it smells like cats all the time in this whole. <laughs> Robbie B, that, that somebody um, at the event at Battle for Salvation, you know, obviously you guys are very popular. So congrats to you guys for spreading your roots everywhere. But um, they were the guy asked me how. I don't many, know how I feel about that statement. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many cats do you actually have is what the guy asked me. I was like, he's got like three, and he was like, they, he swore you had twenty five cats. No, <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> Did my, you show my, him that my, picture? My, my parents have six cats, but they're but they're older folks. That's okay. They, they've had six cats as long as I've been alive. I have yeah. no explanation for That's that. That's like the number of cats they feel is well, the correct number of cats. I be- but I believe if, if Rob did have a significant other that lived with him, then there would be six cats. Yeah. No, Three for, for each sure. of them. Three That's what, yeah. They, they really don't like it when I have women over. They really nope. don't like it. Nope. They're, they're very <laughs> anti-women. Anyways, <laughs> we're done here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming back on the show, Austin. It was, yeah. It's always great having you on here for your uh, uh, boots on the ground uh, reports <laughs> in competitive uh, flavor. We love it. We love it. Um, so that's it for this one. Mike isn't here to take us out, so I'll do it. Make sure you head on over to longword.net. That's the home of the battle reports for exclusive content, early access videos, and more. Become a veteran of the long war today. Check out the longword.net. Become a member of the Hall of Veterans today for the fastest growing library of war game related video content, modeling, painting, and playing, not to mention all the sick discounts we receive from some of our sponsors. TheLongWord.net is committed to bringing hobby back, and we can't do it without you.